Okay, well, I'm going to uh, begin. Uh, I want to welcome all who have joined us uh, on behalf of Mass Peace Action and the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. Thank you for joining today's webinar on the brink, understanding the Ukraine uh, crises uh, and paths toward uh, a just peace. Uh, exercising my prerogatives as the chair, I especially want to welcome friends who I know are joining us uh, from as far as Manila and Mexico. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Gerson. I'm a member of Mass Peace Action's uh, board. Uh, it's no uh, Cold War working group. Uh, and I'm president of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. Ukraine, its identity, and its future relations with Russia and the West lie at the heart of today's military tensions between the world's most heavily armed nuclear powers. Russia has built up forces on three sides of Ukraine, but its senior foreign ministry officials state that Moscow has no plans to invade. Many believe that uh, Vladimir Putin has taken these intimidating steps to gain diplomatic leverage to renegotiate the European security order after NATO expanded uh, and US and German forces now conduct military exercises uh, along Russia's borders. Meanwhile, even as multiple diplomatic processes go forward, which could be understand, uh, understood as the earliest stages of negotiation, President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken and others in Washington have been pounding out bellicose drumbeats insisting that Russia is preparing for a potentially imminent invasion of Ukraine. This morning, Congressman Schiff of the House Intelligence Committee warned on national public radio that we face a dire situation. And this week, President Biden ordered an additional 3,000 troops to Eastern Europe and half a billion dollars worth of uh, new weaponry for Ukraine are on track to be approved uh, by Congress. While no side wants war, as in 1914, we face the danger that an incident, an accident, or a miscalculation could trigger a disastrous war. Despite calls for a moratorium on new uh, NATO memberships uh, and for negotiations leading to a neutral and federated Ukrainian state, the US has apparently offered no more than a willingness to engage in renewed arms control negotiations. It has refused to close NATO's open door, um, uh, which is Moscow's leading demand. This is the case even as France and Germany have long opposed Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's and Georgia's accession uh, to the now noble, uh, global NATO alliance. While Biden and Blinken have insisted that Europe is united behind US leadership in this crisis, President Macron of France has been meeting separately with uh, Putin. France and Germany are pursuing the Normandy process and Turkey's Erdogan is in Moscow today. Friends, Russian and Ukrainian histories are long and complex. It was to gain a better understanding of these histories, how they fuel today's crises, and possible roadmaps to achieve just and peaceful resolution of this most intense post-Cold War confrontation, that we invited uh, two distinguished scholars uh, to help us to understand the forces leading to the crisis and to learn their thinking about how it might be resolved. Before we begin, let me uh, review our ground rules. Professor Sakwa, Professors Sakwa and Khrushcheva will each speak for up to, up to 15 minutes to be followed by a question and answer period. Uh, if you have questions, please post them in the chat box. Uh, Amar Ahmad of Mass Peace Action will help me to identify the questions to be asked. Uh, with well over 100 participants in the webinar, for efficiency's sake, uh, I will then pose the questions. Uh, then to our work together. Uh, Richard Sakwa, who joins us from Britain, is professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent and associate fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. He is renowned for his nuanced and incisive analysis of Russian politics and society. Uh, he uh, served as the head of, uh, of the university's politics and international relations department and has published widely about Soviet, Russian, and post-communist uh, affairs including his illuminating Frontline Ukraine uh, Crisis in the Borderlines uh, and his uh, more recent books, The Paradox, uh, and a book I just learned about and whose title I don't have, which I, I excuse myself. Uh, Nina Khrushcheva is Professor of International Affairs at the New School in New York and an editor of and a contributor to Project Syndicate, an association of newspapers around the world. 
Her articles have appeared in Foreign Policy, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, and other publications. Uh, her latest book is In uh, Putin's Footsteps, Searching for the Soul of an Empire Across Russia's 11 Time Zones, which former U.S. Ambassador Matlock has described as, quote, the most insightful book he has read about Putin's Russia. With that, you had enough of me, and I want to turn the floor over to Professor Sakla. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's great to, to be with you. Uh, well, for us, it's evening, but uh, I think for most people, uh, afternoon. Uh, I want to make four basic points, uh, or at least four sections, and um, see how far we go with that. And my first section will try to provide some sort of overview explaining in as far as I see it explaining how we got to where we are today and uh, in a few minutes I won't be able to do too much but simply I will argue uh, as follows in this first section that uh, between 1989 and 2019 effectively though we can some would say to 2014 we had a cold piece and a cold piece sort of it's uh it appeases some of those issues and uh, associated with a cold war but it's uh, accompanied by attempts and genuine attempts to try to resolve uh, the conflictual potential and it's a type of uh, a new version of what eh car called in the interwar years the 20 years crisis and you could call this a 30 years crisis and uh uh, in the last uh, few years, this has tilted over into what I would argue is now Cold War II, CW2, and that it's this is a full scale confrontation with all of those mechanisms. And I won't go into the detail of how you would define a Cold War, but it's clearly ideological contestation, demonization of the enemy or the protagonist and a whole stack of other uh, features which uh, are extremely reminiscent of that first Cold War, all of which take place under the umbrella of nuclear deterrence. Uh, and we could more also, um, as it were, uh, characterize these years as a slow motion Cuban missile crisis. As a slow motion one, maybe in the long term, but certainly in these last uh, few months, it's uh, uh, the, accompanied by a, what some people would say would be a rash move in 1962, uh, October, it was putting the missiles on Cuba. Today, the mobilization and the saber rattling and militarization, but an attempt to force a uh, well, some sort of a solution, if not a diplomatic one, to what was perceived to be a fundamental problem. Uh, those days, Berlin, Jupiter missiles in Turkey, and so on. And today, uh, the failure to establish what the Russians would call an indivisible security order. So a slow motion Cuban missile crisis, uh, which um, we'll have to see in my final section how it could possibly be resolved. My bottom line is uh, when answering how did we get to where we are today, is that at the end of the first Cold War, uh, in the Gorbachev years, uh, uh, let's use the date 1989 as a symbolic end of the first Cold War, that we had two peace orders on offer. These are two peace orders, not dissimilar, uh, quite reasonably compatible, but not the same. And the first one was the vision put forwards most eloquently by Gorbachev and indeed which had long matured within the Soviet Union uh, which uh, under the moniker later of the new political thinking. This was a view that international politics in the nuclear age facing environmental issues which became very prominent in Gorbachev's thinking at a later point that uh, that international politics could be transcended that with the end of the Cold War, which wasn't just the end of that 30 years since 1945, it was also the end, perhaps uh, in a different way from Fukuyama, but a sense that that long term internal civil war in advanced capitalist democracies between social revolutionary socialism and capitalism was transcended. In other words, a whole stack of things were coming together to create the possibility of a genuinely transformed new type of international politics, a new peace order, which really would be uh, indivisible security. And that within that framework, 
all countries could develop. Um, in a specific European con context, it was focused on a common European home, nowadays called, what well, was until recently, Basha, Europa, uh, Greater Europe, and so on. And uh, this was uh, uh, a really fundamental vision, which culminated uh, in you know, the uh, formulation based on the Helsinki principles uh, of two key principles in the Paris Charter of November 1990, free choice of states to join whatever alliance they wish to, uh, which uh, many commentators in Russia today lament the fact that they agreed to that. But the second point, and if you look at that uh, Paris Charter of November 1990, it also picks up some of those issues in Helsinki, repeated in the Istanbul Declaration of 1999, the Astana commemorative declaration of 2010, that it is balanced by a commitment to indivisible security. Lavrov in some of his speeches lately has forgotten that that is actually, those that word, those that formulation is in the November 1990 document. Okay, so that's the first model, a transformative model, that Russia would join uh, the historic West, the political West as established in the Cold War to create a greater West and in the European continent uh, would join Europe to create a greater Europe. The second view very specifically challenged that one. And uh, this was uh, uh, announced in my, um, George H.W. Bush's speech in Mainz. And the slogan, let's just put it just symbolically, Europe whole and free, which was deliberately designed to challenge the first model, that transformative model. Again, I simply can't go into detail now, but simply will say it was quite clearly and explicitly the memoir of Bush and Scowcroft makes it explicit to seize the intellectual and indeed the political initiative and stop that upstart Gorbachev seizing the intellect, global intellectual agenda. In other words, a reimposition of US hegemony. Uh, and dominance, and of course, this then uh, um, formed um, in moved into um, more specific political challenges to a un unipolar world, an expanding world. So basically, two models: one based on transformation, an agenda which, by the way, continues to this day, versus simple enlargement. And enlargement, we could say all sorts of things about that because it homogenizes political space, it reduces political pluralism, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's only within this logic of a competitive visions of two post-Cold War peace orders that a NATO enlargement took place. And I won't go into all of that now, but NATO enlargement, in other words, is a symptom of that larger failure after 1989, exacerbated it. And as many people, as um, you know, even has been considered recently uh, that, um, well, even Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1995 said NATO enlargement should go forwards. He was a passionate advocate for it. But he said, well, maybe at the same time, we should establish some larger framework uh, diplomatic and political military security framework with Russia. So it was quite clear that even the you know, partisans. OK, so that's the first point. I've gone on too long. Very briefly, my second point would simply say uh, this, it's hardly surprising that Ukraine then becomes the cockpit of these two visions of world order. Both of these uh, earlier visions, by the way, to, uh, support the what I call the Charter International System established in 1945. So the confrontation takes place over Ukraine because there was no resolution of the status of post-Soviet space, uh, different types of models of nation building uh, and state building uh, and so on. So uh, you, 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 the Ukrainian crisis is of course a reflection of deep internal divisions and debates about the appropriate model of state development. I've argued in my book, Frontline Ukraine, that two models were on offer. The monist model, uh, which can be tolerant, can be quite inclusive, but it's got a specific vision of how the Ukrainian state should develop a monolingual. Uh, and, you know, obviously you can keep Russian language and any other language in the kitchen, as they would kindly say, but not be given civic uh, public status. Um, and the other version is this more pluralistic vision, which would be the one that most Western commentators have been supporting the sort of way that a multi plural societies develop in post uh, uh, authoritarian societies uh, like Spain and in, um, you could argue and obviously Canada and many many other federal states so uh, these were the two um, you know that's why these tensions were exploded because two models of uh, international politics two models of Ukrainian state building and the whole thing blows up 
my third very brief section, why? Why now? Why is Putin uh, finally uh, decided, you could argue to quote Tsigankov, Putin's last stand? The feeling that the trend lines were moving against Russia, that today Russia is at a peak of its power in the sense that those hypersonic missiles and all the other stuff announced in 2018 um, gives Russia in the arms control or arms race business is actually probably at the peak of its power before the United States with its massive intellectual financial uh, resources will quickly catch up and outpace. Uh, again, a type of uh, 1950s alleged um, missile gap and uh, catching up. So, uh, you know, in 2018, Putin's State of the Nation speech, quite clearly, he says, you didn't listen to us then, listen to us now, referring to the Munich Security Conference speech of 2007. And of course, the uh, issue, specific issues, the Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, in the second war, in where uh, Azerbaijan seized uh, the um, the Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, or the, around there, the territory is taken, plus the devel development of drone technologies in there, a whole stack of things. Uh, the failure, the blockage and the development or implementation of Minsk II, um, strengthening alignment with China, the speeches uh, these days as Putin is uh, off to China, it must be, on his, must be there by now. Um, so it's a whole few reasons why, in other words, the, it was time to grasp that Ukrainian nettle, but, and with it, that whole failure of the last 30 years. OK, my final, uh, fourth and final section is simply to say, you know, where, what are the options today? And uh, there are three possible uh, ways forwards uh, where it could, we could really um, go now. So the first model of where we could possibly go is pathways to peace. And I will say that the US response to Russia's um, draft security treaties of the 17th of December was actually relatively positive, surprisingly so, talking about diplomatic engagement and opening um, certain lessons. But clearly, um, we're talking about possibly a moratorium and NATO enlargement. It's not pos uh, not excluded. There's no real uh, hurry. Um, NATO, uh, Ukraine was not going to be joining NATO anyway in the short term. Some sort of neutrality for Ukraine is not really going to be negotiable. Uh, implementation of Minsk II. Yes, the Normandy uh, format has been meeting the uh, last few days and is due to meet again. Uh, there, obviously, there's not going to be a new Helsinki, Helsinki II, um, and, uh, or change of regime in Kiev or Moscow anytime soon. Um, but, you know, that I, I actually think that the NATO response was outrageous, but the uh, US response was opening the door to diplomacy. Uh, the, so that's the first part. So there's paths to peace, which will learn those lessons of how the first Cold War ended. The second uh, approach is managed competition. OK, we accept we're in a Cold War. Uh, let us then, uh, how do we go and manage it? Um, Russia will develop its alliance uh, type relations with China uh, that perhaps establish bases in uh, you know, in uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. I mean, I, I think... Uh, Possibly, uh, you know, um, you know, more threats, permanent, permanent uh, deployment of uh, strategic weapons and submarines off the coast of the U.S. Uh, NATO continues, and so we keep on that march of folly uh, as before 1914. And the third option is war, quite simply. And just as in the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, we came closest that we did until today. And that I, I actually don't think that Russia has certainly have not thought for a long time that Russia is planning to invade Ukraine. All of this was to try to kickstart a diplomatic process where Russia believes that it simply hasn't been listened to for the last 30 years. And so it's all about trying to kick the door in to diplomacy, a rather crude way of doing it. But nevertheless, if the door is opened uh, one way or another, then there is a possibility to avoid it. But clearly, the stakes could not be higher. So I do believe that I think the militancy certainly, uh, I mean, it's, un, it's quite clear that NATO and its members egged on by um, some, um, you know, bit, embittered East European countries and London, of course, it really is not in no mood for diplomacy. It's the language precisely which would have prevented if Reagan and George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev had used this sort of language back in the late 1980s, we would never have ended the first Cold War. And so today, uh, I think 
um, we need to learn from how the first Cold War end ended to maybe mitigate the second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sakwa. Uh, I have to say there was a lot in there and uh, I'll confess that I'm gonna go back and listen to that a second time uh, just to make sure I can properly digest it all. With that, I wanna turn the floor over to uh, Professor Khrushcheva. Thank you very much. Um, I am. I will try to be brief, although it is hard because it's a lot of history. Um, I just want to uh, address a few things that Professor Sakwa said, if I may, at the beginning. Uh, he talks about Cold War, mentioned that now we're in Cold War II. I am, probably we are, but I would rather keep it for now as frozen peace, just because um, when we look back and try to define our present realities by past uh, problems and issues, it's very difficult then to move forward in decisions. So I agree with you, but I would kind of keep, keep the, new, the, the new definitions rather than use the old ones. Uh, and another thing that you mentioned, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which of course, you know, in Russia is basically discussed every day, uh, was a remarkable um, kind of understanding because uh, when Khrushchev, um, when it began with, with Khrushchev's idea that we are going to, when he looked at, uh, at uh, missiles in, uh, in Turkey from Bulgaria and he said, we are going to, uh, to drop a, a hedgecock in uh, Uncle Sam's pants. And so the discussion today is how the United States is dropping a hedgecock in Putin's pants by uh, arming Ukraine. So that is uh, something that we have in common, but I think what I'm not seeing at least, at least not until recently is the uh, decision uh, or at least willingness on both sides to in fact uh, step down and step back a bit. And I do hope that with this uh, responses that I agree with Professor Sakwa was uh, US responses uh, were quite promising. Maybe that will in diplomacy begin because what we did notice for this two month that when diplomatic, uh, diplomatic conversations were going, the three meetings that were happening in January, in fact, it was amazing how the US, particularly US diplomats would come out of the meeting uh, and would say, oh, we just tell Putin that it's not gonna happen. So that's really, I mean, I felt like the, uh, the Western side actually sabotaging, uh, sabotaging those talks for um, uh, its own kind of war mongering purposes, which I address, uh, address in a moment, because generally when you have a security talks or kind of diplomatic conversation, it should bring uh, not more escalation, but de-escalation, which exactly not uh, what happened. And uh, uh, Professor Sackwell already said it very, very well, I'm not going to repeat it, uh, that the conversation really has not been going and not been going for quite some time. And this is something that I'd like to address, that basically it's very hard for both sides to talk past someone uh, when they're in the same room. And that's exactly what was happening, at least during those meetings. Uh, and in fact, Russia and we can, you know, I'm not going to go into deeper history. I just want to concentrate a little bit more on Putin. Uh, so Russia and the West have been talking past each other for almost of Putin's 21 now, 22 years. Uh, of course, there was a brief honeymoon period, as you remember, in 2001, when George Bush famously uh, looked into his eyes and had a sense of his soul, and Putin was quite helpful. Uh, because one of the things that are important to uh, remember is that, and, and Professor Sakwa mentioned, it, it's just you have to have the door uh, slam open to start diplomacy because the way, and not just Putin, but Khrushchev with the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, many SARS before them really felt that they are kind of the Western little brother or little dirty cousin. Uh, that uh, every time when there are negotiations, unless you break the door open, uh, essentially Russia is always be, is always seated uh, at the children's table next to, uh, table next to the toilet, and that's something that Putin decided that he is going to uh, to kind of uh, rectify now, because after two thousand one, very quickly it went just downhill from there. Those possible relationship uh, and uh, uh, you know clearly Ukraine policy is um, uh, is uh, kind of 
that is uh, that um, uh, uh, concentration of that for a variety of reasons, for a variety of uh, Russian reasons, obviously, because they do think, uh, and Putin has been uh, saying uh, very um, uh, kind of very forcefully that we are of the same nation, the West cannot divide us, uh, we came from the same origins. And in, if we look at it in geopolitical terms, essentially Ukraine now plays the role of Poland, what Poland was in the later years uh, in um, uh, during the, the communist uh, communist bloc. And so Ukraine now just the, the border, the Western border, Eastern border was pushed towards, uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, but really Ukraine, so uh, one of the things that I think the West, uh, particularly the United States gets very wrong that this is not a Soviet legacy project. Uh, and uh, in fact, they, we heard it a lot at the beginning that you know, Putin wants to reinstate the Soviet Union. And I think it's much, much, much bigger than that uh, and much longer than that. And he himself explained it. And I have to take his word for it that uh, you know, it's a Russian history we're dealing, uh, dealing with. And in fact, the West already, I mean, the US, US already sees that this whole conversation of the reinstatement of the Soviet Union tomorrow. And I think by now we've got we've passed five dates that we were given when it's going to happen. Uh, so now the invasion apparently is not imminent, uh, even the troops are sent and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is a bit of an embarrassment for the United States, but what I've noticed uh, after living here for many, many years, you, the United States is never wrong and essentially never embarrassed by its mistakes. It's somehow just somebody else. That, is, that means Putin is, 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 is responsible for those. Uh, uh, so he does, I mean, that whole thing that, that Russia is the same ilk as, 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 uh, uh, as Ukraine or Ukraine is the same ilk as Russia cannot be separated. And many have read it as he wants to, to Putin wants to take it. Um, uh, you know, there were maps, as you know, uh, all over Western press, how, you know, the, the, the direct route to Kiev and so on. This was ridiculous. I mean, any, any decent Russian Kremlinologist should have known it's not true. And yet they just chose to, uh, to um, uh, push that narrative. And I completely agree with Professor Sakwa that was never, uh, I mean, never, you don't know, but certainly that was more of a muscly move, sort of bluff brinkmanship. Uh, uh, blackmail, but not, uh, I mean, what is Putin going to do with a country, with 40 million country that hates his guts? So that was not an idea, but it was a convenient kind of Western rhetoric and not to take, once again, not to take Russian, uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian issues or Russian concerns into consideration. So when Putin was saying that Ukraine is of the same ilk, uh, when, I mean, he wrote an article uh, to, to that point uh, in the summer. In fact, actually, I don't know if you followed, he wrote an article about China and how now China and Russia are the greatest of friends. I think yesterday uh, he did right before going to the Olympics. Uh, so when he was writing that article and making his points known, I think it was more, it was not for the Ukrainians. I mean, Ukrainians know exactly what they are to the Russians and Russians know exactly what Ukrainians are. It was more for the West is basically get out of our region. Um, uh, Barack Obama, as you remember, memorably said uh, that Russia is um, just a regional power. And so they, Putin's message now, <laughs> regional power, get out of my region, stop meddling in that region, uh, in, in that region anymore. Um, and I want to um, sort of talk a little bit of history, uh, even in the 90s, although I said I'll be talking about Putin, uh, the great George Kennan, who we really need more of those, and we don't have them, unfortunately, who, as you remember, the great architect of sort of Soviet containment policy. I was very lucky. I worked with him at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. I was his, his last research assistant. So we spoke a lot about kind of issues of geopolitics. And he would certainly take kind of a nuanced view. And even then, uh, in um, uh, he would always thought that you know Russia's behavior is best explained by his special nation mindset, and Putin, with Putin's case, it would, was exasperated precisely because in his years uh, he is very concerned that the United States does have a special nation mindset, and why not Russia? And even if it's own region, it's not allowed to be what. Uh, what um, uh, what the U.S. can do everywhere. So when U.S. is is annoyed with Russia's claim of uh, 
uh, spheres of influence, Putin's response is, wait a minute, you, you think the whole world is your sphere of influence, what about me? Uh, and of course that annoys the United States, you know, sort of that American exceptionalism, how dare he challenges, he, how dare he to challenge us, um, uh, our supremacy. And as much as Ukraine in the middle of this conversation is really uh, in many ways in an afterthought, it's a, may, it's a way to make a point for both, uh, for, both, um, uh, for both sides. And that is something to uh, kind of very unfortunate for Ukraine because it does seem to be uh, to be the ball that they keep pushing in, into each other or past each other's, uh, past each other's gates. Uh, uh, so when in, 2000, uh, in 2008, when George Bush agreed that Georgia and Ukraine uh, inclusion into NATO may happen someday, Putin already then, I mean, one of the things about Putin is that if he were to invade Ukraine, you wouldn't know about it. It would just happen when we all asleep. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, this is all very, very show off. Show what what what's happening with all the troops in, in Ukraine, and then Belarus, and then um, all the uh, military ship kind of roaming the international waters and whatnot. So this is for show. Uh, but Putin already in 2008 warned that they would be a problem. Uh, and remember uh, when in 2008, Mikhail Saakashvili, the uh, Georgian president at the time, uh, sort of encouraged by US support and military support, went into South Ossetia, this breakaway Republic of South Ossetia, to claim it back to Georgia. And you know, Russia, of course, responded. And Kennan recognized that in, in early on, sort of from the start, when in 98, the US Senate ratified NATO's extension to Estonia, Latvia, and, uh, and Lithuania, he predicted that Russia would gradually react quite adversely to those things, and the West would claim it's just, of course, that's how Russians always are, which is how Russians always are, but there's always, you know, for the Russians, there's always a reason to be like that. And sure enough, Putin now is demanding, uh, you know, the memberships would be would be denied, and uh, uh, of course, the U.S. refuses. It's not possible. It cannot be um, uh, you know, what Romania is going to be taken out of it? Of course not. It's not, it's not possible, but it is because Putin, like many people before him, like Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis, felt that he was not listened to, uh, that he would uh, really need to res uh, resort to this bluff brinkmanship and blackmail. And I understand why the US and NATO doesn't want to allow him to do that. And that's, you know, fine. And he should not be allowed to do that. But in response, uh, Bob Menendez and others said essentially be arguing for war to stop him. And I think, I mean, and that's why I'm glad that we're having this, uh, this webinar or this seminar, because that's really not the answer either, because you can want to put Putin on his knees. And, and one TV anchor recently said to me, what do we need to do? To put her on his knees, well, well, certainly not war. So certainly to have some sort of a, uh, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, certainly some sort of conversations and possible, and possible solu solutions. Because uh, when the West uh, consistently dismisses or dismissed has dismissed the Kremlin security concerns uh, relating to ex-Soviet countries, portrays Russian resistance to NATO eastward expansion as a paranoid revanchism. That is fine. Could be. Uh, they say nobody threatening Russia, the sort of the, the logic goes that democracies don't threaten, but we actually know it's not true. So it becomes kind of that great uh, American or Western hypocrisy. Of course they threaten. I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, Russia threatens its neighbor, but there was Iraq. Uh, they were also killing uh, of dictators the United States doesn't like. And Putin is thinking, well, he may be next. Uh, because if the United States continues not to like him and kind of follow Bob Menendez's suggestions, then you know who can prevent uh, who could prevent America in the future just to go and take him out? Which of, of course you know nobody nobody wants to follow that. Um, um, uh, for no, nobody wants to have that that kind of fate. And you know if we talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, Fidel Castro was uh, uh, they were about I think 640 or something, something close to that attempts on his life. So if you, if you are Putin and if you're sitting where you're sitting, you certainly have all these concerns that you need to address. And you only, you don't need to address, you, you are addressing not only just for yourself, but you're also addressing it for, for the Russian nation because Putin, it's his last essentially hooray. And he, 
needs to go in history and what he's going to go in history as um, as so he went in his at the beginning it was you know NATO uh, enlarged in his presence a lot of countries actually became members of NATO uh, during his presence so now his final act is to make sure that NATO is not going to that uh, defensive but uh, could be offensive alliance to Russia is not going close to the borders and in fact the more kind of this war rhetoric comes from the United States for their own political purposes, the more actually Ru Russians have very began to be afraid of war uh, because they also afraid that Putin may react, uh, but also kind of uniting, not again, not around him, but certainly against sort of those American uh, rhetoric and maybe even American standing uh, so that uh, bolsters Putin's support to some degree, bolsters support for the Kremlin, even without a war. So he can now stand on that border forever while everybody is playing a guessing game. And the United States, the more it promises that he will attack tomorrow, uh, the worse uh, the worse it looks. Because Russians also feel now that they don't want to sacrifice their own kind of interest or sort of perceived security. Um, and. So one last thing that I just wanted to uh, to add, and I already alluded to this, is that uh, one of the Putin's decisions to act the way he acts is that he's just decided that it is kind of waning, um, uh, waning years in power, uh, although there may be many, but clearly they are on the downturn rather than on the upturn, uh, is that he's just not going to take uh, and militantly and, and openly and loudly is not going to take American exceptionalism at face level and in fact point out to all the um, kind of all the horrible things that happen um, under the US, uh, US supervision. And in fact, he does have China, he does have Turkey, he does have um, um, Hungary, he does have uh, other countries to in fact kind of be in his camp. It's not the Warsaw Pact yet, or never will be, but they're certainly, uh, certainly interested, uh, interested parties. Um, and so that something go back to George Kennan, um, you know, when the war, the cycle of crisis, unless Russia is heard and getting out of this children's table next to the toilet, the cycle of crisis will continue with escalating and potentially, of course, catastrophic risks. Um, and George Cannon pointed out a long time ago, such as destructive potential of advanced, advanced modern weapons, and they got much greater and more advanced since then, that another great conflict between any of the leading powers could well do irreparable damage to the entire structure of modern civilization. So there is, I think there is only political solution to the Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, Austria, 1955, Finland after World War II, um, perhaps Ukraine will become part of the European Union very quickly, but it would be uh, demilitarized and agreed on how Russia too will demilitarize. For example, there would be, um, I don't know, weapons taken out of Kaliningrad. I mean, that, that's, that's a tall order, but I think that could be the only conversation that the US and, and NATO can have with, uh, with, with Russia from now on. Thank you. You know, thank you. It's, uh, again, a, a lot to digest, and uh, I, I trust those in the, on, in, the, in the call who are now about what, 270 uh, will, will, will be listening again and, and working it through. <laughs> I'm aware that we only have, you know, till, till the hour, but we've got, that gives us uh, uh, 20 minutes. Questions have uh, really backed up. Uh, I see a hand from, uh, from several people. We're going to go through taking the questions. Uh, from the chat. So please put your, your questions there. Uh, I want to start with, by one, uh, with one from David Keppel, uh, who asks if the OSCE uh, could theoretically serve as an alternative to, to NATO, in a sense, the possibility of going back to something of the vision of the immediate uh, post-Cold War period. Uh, and I guess I'd like to ask each of you to, to respond to that. Who should go first? Why don't, why don't you jump in? Okay, uh, absolutely. Uh, OSC is still an important body, but it never fa it was never developed as a full scale organization and institution, as certainly Russia wanted, um, and uh, it still retains uh, um, largely the conference format from its uh, origins 
in the Helsinki uh, meeting, well, in the final act uh, of Helsinki 1975. So is a, I think that boat, I mean, it's important, but that boat has gone. So OSCE will be a background and a facilitator, but there's, uh, we, you know, it, we, the, the issue is now bigger even than that. So uh, we're talking about exactly what, um, I mean, uh, I've been arguing as well that NATO enlargement in and of itself may be no such bad thing. It stops Turkey and Greece going to war. It stops those small states going to war with each other. It stops the repetition of what happened in the interwar years, but it has to be uh, located within a bigger overarching security framework in which OSCE is election monitoring and border monitoring and conflict resolution has a part to play. NATO has its part to play, but we need to be bolder. If you remember in the early 90s, there was talk of a European Security Council under the OSCE, which would have been a mini United Nations. All these ideas were rejected by Washington for good reasons, because it clearly would have displaced it from its centrality. Uh, so, um, no, so what we do need now, and that's the big, if you like, the um, plan maximum, as Lenin would say, uh, for the um, for, for the moment, is this, you know, I would, I would personally, not a Yalta to, but a Helsinki too. And it took years to prepare for Helsinki final meeting in 1975. So I don't think, you know, it's it won't be tomorrow, it won't be next month, but within a year or two, if the US response is taken seriously, and I think it was a serious response, and I think Biden, by the way, uh, I'm not as close to him as you guys are, but uh, I think Biden has been, you know, impressive in the sense that he met Putin in June, that summit in Geneva, opening the door to negotiations. And uh, I think that he also is in perhaps, uh, I was going to say, maybe he's got many years, but certainly on a declining lap, as it were, uh, and wants to make sure that on his watch, uh, we uh, can finally perhaps to resolve uh, this uh, this issue of, you know, it's extraordinary, 30 years after the end of the first Cold War, we're still talking about it, almost exactly the same issues again. Nina, from a Russian perspective, how do you see this? Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Richard that um, that boat has sailed. Uh, my problem with that is that I don't, I really, don't, I mean, I don't think the United States, please forgive me, wants to resolve the conflict uh, because they, for them, that is uh, appeasing Putin and, you know, no Bob Menendez or Chris Murphy would want to appease Putin. And as for Biden, I'm sure he meant it, but I think one of the reasons the, the conflict uh, happened uh, today is precisely because after they met in June uh, and Putin sort of said, fine, whatever, you think I'm a murderer, but at least when it's, we understand each other, we need predictable relationship. And really nothing happened since then, because I also don't think that Biden's White House uh, or certainly Biden's um, uh, Secretariat of State uh, is willing to, in fact, uh, the way they would look at it to appease Putin or have steps made towards uh, towards Russia. So I wouldn't, I mean, may, my Biden may, may want it, but the people he put in charge of that really don't. And so I think that, uh, um, you know, and once again, no offense, I, I teach American culture uh, as a Russian from a Russian perspective. So it is a little bit of a gun-ho nation and, and they do take wars uh, easier than uh, than others who uh, truly participate uh, in them in the mid and being in the middle of it. So I I think that as long as Washington keeps saying that it's back and it's leading the world, I don't think that relationship would. Uh, maybe they will avoid the conflict, but I don't think the conflict, as George Kennan said, unless we continue, unless that is resolved on some other level, it's not going to be resolved because as long as Russia pushed. Uh, uh, as, as long as Ru Russia is being pushed or, or perceived itself as being pushed, it's not going to give up because for American formula of leading, everybody needs to follow and Russia never follows. I mean, anybody who studies Russian history knows that it would never follow. And so basically in some ways it is a problem that may have no solution. So I need to, uh, before going further, I need to apologize uh, in that there are a number of demonstrations being called for across the United States, I believe this Saturday, uh, urging urging no war and diplomacy. Uh, and uh, Amar, if you could uh, put the link so people can find out where there are different demonstrations and people can join if they wish, that would be 
uh, really helpful. Uh, I want to kind of jump to a different a different place here. Uh, Jenny Clegg uh, in with, with with Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in Britain is, is asking if there's if, if we're looking at a triangulation possibility here. Uh, if uh, do you think it conceivable that the U.S. and and Russia might move out of this crisis into some form of detente, which in turn would allow U.S. military might to be even more concentrated against China? Uh, and uh, either either or both of you. Nina, do you want to start on that one? Well, I'm not. I I'm not an expert on on, on China, and I don't know. But I, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I think. I mean, clearly when Biden came in, his idea was that um, he needs predictable relationship with Russia because the main rival is really China. Russia doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to kind of take over American role in the world uh, like China does, uh, as I said. And I mean, I keep repeating that, that basically what Russia wants is not to be seated next to the toilet and be listened to. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that uh, ultimately uh, that all the China is a bigger, um, bigger competition, clearly much bigger competition uh, than Russia, but Russia is such a familiar, such a good familiar enemy. You don't have to feel bad about it. It's politically correct. You can't quite say, I hate the Chinese. That's really racist, but easily uh, you can say, I hate the Russians because you really know how to do that, it's like riding a bike in a sense. Uh, so I don't know, because I also think that, uh, you know, that that kind of, I mean, please forgive me, I'm using Maria Zaharova's words, which the, she's the uh, Ministry of Foreign Relations uh, in Russia. She's a spokeswoman and she's herself somewhat um, prone to hysterical statements. But, uh, you know, I don't, I think only the Russian and Russian war hysteria can uh, can have that level uh, because I think that now it seems to me that the State Department, not sure the White House, uh, decided uh, and then actually then so Congress, some people in Congress, they decided that Putin is the new Saddam Hussein and that invasion in in Ukraine, uh, which is no longer imminent apparently, as we were told. Uh, after many months of it being imminent, uh, that that invasion is the weapons of mass destruction. So I don't know what kind of resolution America is preparing for that kind of scenario, but it does seem to be, uh, at least uh, until recently, the, the scenario that was happening. Just two words to say that, uh, no, I mean, the answer quite clearly is that there is, uh, in the immediate future, I mean, a good few years, no possibility of US to having a wedge between Russia and China. That relationship, yes, it has its difficulties, it's got its uh, hard moments, but this is something which is going to be, I think, shaping the destiny of the world for the next few decades. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the old, to return to the old Kissinger triangle uh, way back in 1972, that relations between the US should always be better than neither with Moscow and Beijing than the relations between those two. Well, that ain't going to happen anytime soon. And so if the United States does pivot to focus, because that initially was the idea, people argue about the Biden administration, stabilize relations with Russia to focus on uh, on China. But what does it mean, focus on China? Does it mean, you know, uh, going, um, recognizing Taiwan independence, which is full scale war? So in other words, perhaps Ukrainians are doing us all a favor by uh, distracting the United States. And, you know, you know, this one is, as I agree completely with Nina, this is, uh, you know, nothing is excluded, but the, it's not, we're not really talking actually of an invasion, but at least it's keeping the United States busy. Then it's going to be involved with the midterms at the end of this year, and then the presidential election coming afterwards. And so China survives this time. Uh, but of course, the US policy cycle seems to be getting shorter and shorter and shallower and shallower, which is very disturbing to the rest of the world um, uh, about how policy, and you talk about Menendez and all those others. You mentioned Adam Schultz at the beginning. Well, Adam Schiff is the man who continued pushing this Russia Gate, the deception, which I the book which you you know I've written on Russia Gate. And you know, he really is 
you know, he plucks ideas and, you know, um, based on nothing, on fantasy. And uh, one has to say, again, that uh, the, you mentioned, and Nina mentions the State Department, absolutely right, uh, Blinken, but above all Sullivan, because Sullivan was very much the one who pushed the Russiagate narrative. So in other words, it seems to be, you know, for looking at it from outside, a bit of a fantasy world in which the US policy community is, is working. I just wanted to, yeah, no, I just wanted to say to, to uh, Richard mentioned Adam Skiff is that the steel dossiers, you, I'm sure you all followed, then turn out to be, you know, sort of one of those Russian bunker stories itself. And yet nobody really apologized. And then Skiff continues to defend it and saying, well, it was solid intelligence. We just, you know, over, over, over blew it. No, I think it is. I mean, and that's what I mean. It's a kind of gunfight in nation and we're fighting, you know, high noon all day, every day. And, uh, and Russia is a great, uh, really a great target for that. I mean, Boris and Natasha would never be forgotten while other countries ultimately just becomes either too scary or too, too politically correct. And so I think Russia is, a, is here for a long haul. So we have a lot of questions here. I'm not, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them. One question that's sort of out there in the um, in sectors of, of, of the discourse here uh, has to do with the role of, of uh, neo-Nazi forces in Ukraine. Could uh, either or both of you comment on your, your sense of to what degree uh, they are meaningful forces and need to be a source of concern or to what extent they're, they're marginal and, and uh, we, we should not be focusing on that? Well, that extreme right movement, perhaps some are Nazis, but, you know, that extreme radicalized right has been holding Ukrainian host policy hostage since uh, February 2014. And that's why even when Zelensky, who was elected on well over 70 percent of the vote as the peace candidate. And by the way, Poroshenko also on the 25th of May 2014 was elected as the peace candidate because Ukrainians are you know, I've spent a lot of time there. Peace, you know, it's like Russians. They're not, there's no, you know, the heroic age, as somebody just recently put, is over. Neither of these countries want war. The people in Ukraine don't. The Russians certainly don't. There's no war fever. There's no even war mentality, apart from some overheated elites uh, in some of those chat shows on Sunday nights. But, but, you know, it's just not on. But these guys are holding the whole polity hostage. And uh, when they the Normandy format met in December 2019, they were already mobilizing against a possible implementation of Minsk II or any other peace deal, uh, even before they'd sat down to talk. So, you know, how can you move forward? So, yes, they're, they are acting. They've got a knee to the neck of the Ukrainian polity, which is catastrophic. And I must say, it's a failure of our European leadership, the Normandy for. And above all, I will say this, of Angela Merkel, who simply did not put enough pressure on Kiev to fulfill its own obligations. Now, I do understand the reasons why some people would say Minsk II was a forced peace. Yeah, we all understand that. But we simply have to move forwards. And that's the only framework there was to move forwards. And uh, these, so these guys are exceptionally important. Just a few words. I mean, uh, the Minsk agreement is horrible. It really is horrible. And that's why no Poroshenko and no Zelensky want to implement it because essentially it is almost giving uh, those territories, I mean, sort of legalizing uh, the, uh, the breaking of territories, but there is really no better solution. So they have to have somehow agree on that now and then move into political process, uh, process later on. Uh, and it is really unfortunate because uh, when Zelensky came, as Richard said, he was a peace candidate, but he was losing, uh, he was losing popularity. He couldn't really move on either way. And you notice that the first time when the Russian troops were building up uh, mm -hmm. in the spring, last spring, and there was also sort of 100,000, it was a talk, talk of war. It began when Zelensky decided that he's going to sort of side up with the Ukrainian nationalists because that's how you keep uh, the country. That's how you keep your war rhetoric go. And you know, war is the force that gives us gives us meaning. And then he was kind of running around the, uh, as they said, uh, the the connection line, 
in, uh, in a helmet and military fatigues. And that's to, to that Putin began responding because suddenly Ukrainians and Ukrainian uh, kind of national movements were saying, we're going to take, we're going to take Crimea by, by force. And so he became a hostage to that, uh, to that power. And now he's basically stuck because he can't have war because you can't have war, but he also cannot have peace because then he's going to lose, uh, to lose this powerful force in the country. And then in fact, uh, Pyotr Poroshenko and others in, in former former president, others in Ukrainian politics are much more of a war president. So in some ways, Ukraine is, is, is also in the no, no man's land. So we should worry about it. And I actually think that Europe is doing a uh, disservice to itself mm -hmm. because it somehow uh, kind of disregards uh, what's happening and it disregards the opportunity to stand up, stand up and to say that those new fascist uh, fascist movements around the former fights with the with the Soviet Union during World War II, they can exist because they fight against Russia as those in World War II fascists existed. Uh, oh, not because they were Nazis, but because they were fighting against the Soviet Union. I think that Europe itself, I mean, once again, all these things play into Putin's hands because the minute he sees hypocrisy, he's a judo master. He jumps right in and he immediately, immediately creates uh, creates a, a horrible sore for everybody then to try to heal and, and resolve a problem. So I'm, I'm hoping, Nina, we can hold you in for a little bit longer. I, I know you may have to leave. Uh, two questions kind of, kind of related to uh, co closely to Ukraine. Uh, one is, how should we understand um, Russia's uh, seizure of Crimea in 2014 uh, and, and the politics of Crimea today. Why don't we start with that one? And then I wanna ask a, a, there's another question here about the, the possibility of, of Ukraine becoming a neutral state. But why don't we start with Ukraine, which I think is important for us to clarify for people. You mean Ukraine, Ukraine or Crimea? What do you say? I'm sorry, let's just start with Crimea, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so the Russian explanation for Crimea is that uh, NATO was, um, as you know, Maidan was happening, the revolution was happening. Uh, Victoria Nuland, who is now, by the way, driving the Russian policy, policy which is, of course, gives us great hope for mm -hmm. resolutions. Uh, so she was the one who was saying, screw you, screw Europe, because it's not forceful enough and pushing Ukrainians towards more um, kind of a greater resistance to, to the Russian forces or greater kind of great embrace of uh, militant democratic uh, democratic actions. And so the decision on, on, on the Kremlin part was that, well, at least that part of the land that was ours, the way Russians look at it, it was always ours. Uh, it was the beginning of us. Uh, how could it be just part of that um, uh, if if NATO comes to Ukraine, as it was promised already, then then we certainly are going to lose Crimea. We cannot uh, we cannot have the Western Crimea. So that's what the um, kind of the official line was. Uh, it is a as always that everything that Putin does has a little bit of a or, or a lot of uh, uh, misleading. A misleading statement because his assistants were working on Crimea and looking into this whole Crimea issue for quite some time because, uh, you know, nationalism is part of any culture and one of the nationalistic um, uh, kind of forces uh, or possibilities that, that Russian nationalists uh, explored uh, in relations to other nations was that Crimea was ours, it was taken away. I and mean, of course, Khrushchev is guilty because technically, supposedly Khrushchev was the one who, uh, who transferred Crimea to Ukraine as a republic within the Russian Federation. Although that true is a mythology, he did not. Uh, it was 1954 and he was only the leader of the Communist Party, but was not the leader of the, of the government and was not the leader of, um, uh, of, uh, of the state. Uh, so he did not uh, transfer. Uh, nonetheless, that was a big uh, kind of patriotic, patriotic moment. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, uh, railed Putin this time around when the, the Crimea, um, uh, how was it called the Crimea? 
platform, right? The Crimea platform uh, that uh, Kiev uh, in, uh, sort of organized in the summer and European leaders and American not leaders, but certainly representatives participated. So that was a call for reclaiming Crimea back. So of course, the Russians who think that Crimea is, uh, is, is theirs, of course, responded. Uh, so that's the Crimea story and just a little bit of a historical comment. Um, I'm writing a book about Khrushchev, somehow it happened. And I've been looking at all these documents and, and, and transcripts. And it was interesting that, uh, that uh, when um, after World War II, when the Crimean Tatars were kicked out uh, from Crimea by Stalin, uh, uh, there were suggestions to turn Crimea into a Jewish state. So that could be a wonderful Jewish state and you know they would live there. And both Stalin and then Khrushchev said, well, we can have that because then it will be absolutely the platform for the West. So that kind of battle for Crimea's soul being a Russian soul versus versus being under the Western influence, it's, it's very important and it's not going to go anywhere, it will continue. Uh, Richard, just maybe to ask here, should we expect that Crimea is going to be a the open bleeding sore throughout the new Cold War? No, actually, that is possibly one of the uh, not easiest. There's nothing easy in this at all, but one in which uh, I think even the Western leaders and I talked to people after 2014 and uh, they were willing to accept because it's quite clear that the, um, the great majority of the people in Crimea today um, are in favor of staying with Russia. I mean, they were before, and Dina, Dina's absolutely right, this has been a long issue. Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow, was very active on that front uh, and so on. Moscow State University opened the filial branch there earlier, etc. cetera. But um, no, Crimea, and second, uh, in addition to what was said, is that in 2014, and ultimately, you know, the, it was a defensive move, even though, you know, there were lots of options. Um, and the key issue was Sevastopol, the naval basis, base. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as, as I've said elsewhere, but I'll say it again now, the loss of, you know, all the cultural sides, one thing, but the loss of Sevastopol would have been the biggest defeat of any major power in, you know, a thousand years. I mean, it's huge. It's just simply, you know, in the present, the way that international state system works, that would have been something just simply intolerable. Uh, and, you know, it was quite clear that the United States had, you know, some forces there. 2008, I think, they landed in Crimea when Yushchenko was president, uh, and they were chased by away by uh, local villagers with pitchforks. But, you know, the back of the mind of the Russians was, you know, it wouldn't be NATO. NATO enlargement wasn't on the agenda at that time, 2014 and so on. But uh, US forces were because, you know, 800 bases, let's have another one. We need yet another one. And of course, Sevastopol would be the, you know, the, the absolute prize of prizes. And Putin simply couldn't accept that. And it was the worst thing because Putin, you know, I mean, so you like about him, but he really did try to stabilize these borders. That's the first thing he did on coming to power. Let's accept all the borders as they are. But with that, within the basis of that peace model one, indivisibility of secure, indivisibility of security. So then, uh, questions about Ukrainian neutrality: uh, is this is this within the realms of possibility, and and if so, how might it be achieved? I just I'll quickly say that it's uh, it's within the realm of necessity, but unfortunately in the realm of impossibility. It's a sensible outcome. I would advocate it. Austria has thrived in that context. Ireland, the Republic of Ireland has thrived. And you mentioned Finland and others. Uh, so it would, and of course, don't forget that neutrality was the official position of Ukraine until December 2014, when uh, after the neo-nationalist government removed it. But of course, they've been going backwards and forwards over the years. But so it's not even an alien idea to uh, Ukraine, Ukraine itself. But you know, given the, you know, it would, this sort of thing, and again, I agree completely with Nina when she says that the European leaders have shown an extraordinary lack of leadership and indeed lack of consistency because Europe likes to present itself as a normative power. And yet when it's facing the big challenge of live up to your own standards, they have spectacularly failed 
in Ukraine and discredited even, one has to say, the European project. And I say this from a country smarting from Brexit and having left the U European Union. But there is that, you know, Ukraine is a sort of at the moment, not the nation and not the people, I don't mean our society, I mean the political situation. It's like an open wound. And Nina made the comparison of Poland uh, in, uh, in the Soviet period, but I would go further. It's like Poland in the whole 19th century, which spread out and you know, ultimately constantly denigrated the Russian Empire, you know, had many, many faults, but it, you know, it became presented as the epitome of darkness and evil and backwardness. Um, so uh, today this is spreading out in the same sort of way. And so whether neutrality could be, you know, it's a sensible way out, but I'm afraid we're not living in the age of sensibleness. That I agree with. And I mean, that's why we kind of go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the leaders then actually mm -hmm. wanted to resolve it. And I just don't mm -hmm. see um, too much too much desire to resolve it. We just, as if we all live in the kind of the meta world that you know, has been created for us by Donald Trump and Mark Zuckerberg and, um, and others, I guess, uh, at, at this point. And I also, once again, I mean, Putin is not getting more democratic and not getting better. He needs to be listened to, but he himself, I mean, in 2014, he did exasperate the crisis. I mean, he could have gone to the United Nations. He could have done all sorts of things that were much more acceptable than that uh, weird referendum that he had. I mean, yes, that's true. They are on the uh, people there want to be Russians. However, uh, it could have been done differently. Then in his defense, he would say, well, but nobody listens to me anyway. It wouldn't even been accepted because the only way I can handle it is my own uh, is my own Russian way. And I think we really, I mean, I go back to what I said. Uh, I mean, I think it ultimately will be resolved. But at this point, until they all scream their heads out uh, and hopefully with, with no shooting nonetheless, uh, it's not gonna happen. So a question for Nina. Um, uh, will, Putin Next, stay uh, as, will Putin stay as president in 2024? Well, until this, I thought he, uh, he may not uh, because there've been a lot of conversation of how he's looking for ways to, to get out of power. Uh, I think after what happened in Kazakhstan, probably uh, the example of Nazarbayev, or President Nazarbayev uh, clearly didn't work out. Uh, and I think that that really gives Putin much more doubt that he can ever leave because if he does, uh, and I've been saying it, I mean, I actually think wrote about it many, many years ago, he really, the fate that awaits him is of Lavrentiy in Tiberia, uh, the Stalin secret police, because he created or perfected the system of governance uh, that really eliminates its opponents or eliminates those who uh, step away. Uh, so I think, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that probably we're, we're gearing towards the Stalin formula when uh, he's going to be that old and, and die. Unless, of course, when the Brits now will probably or may sanction all of his uh, great oligarchs, uh, then they may influence. But I don't believe, I don't think that Putin is now, uh, he reached the point when he cannot be influenced by such trivial things mm -hmm. as uh, somebody else's wealth. For example, we know that his daughters, although they lived abroad, now they're saved back in the Russian fold and get medals for all this great, uh, all their great achievements. Uh, so the this is the long answer. The short the short answer. I'm not sure. I don't know. But Russia really doesn't have that many examples of leaders actually leaving power. So we had Khrushchev that was ousted. We had Gorbachev that was the lost the country to govern over. We have the only person who resigned by himself is Boris Yeltsin. He had no other choice. So I, I don't see how Putin, at least the way it stands now, he is going to do it because he may feel like Stalin who was saying uh, before he died, he was saying to Khrushchev and others, you're like small kittens without me. You're going to be swallowed by, uh, by the West immediately. And I think it seems like Putin is already feeling this way that if he's gone, he will be, every, everybody will be swallowed. So he needs to stay. So, so a couple of questions about nuclear weapons um, and maybe I'll ask them both at the same time. Uh, one is what do you what do you uh, believe the uh, the impact of this Ukraine crisis on the negotiations to um, uh, revitalize restore the JCPOA uh, United States and Iran 
And I guess the other question is, as, as the negotiation process goes forward between the United States and, and Russia, uh, other countries to the degree that they're in, uh, what do, where do you think that might lead in, in terms of, of nuclear arms control? Maybe Richard for this one? Yeah, uh, I mean, you feel that um, uh, was, maybe it was my internet connection was unstable, but you feel Sorry. yourself here. But just on the JCPOA, the larger context, of course, is that Iran is uh, you know, moving into a Shanghai cooperation organization and the new hardline president. Obviously, negotiations are continuing in Vienna. Uh, and, you know, we certainly hope that some sort of negotiated framework could be established. But it's and of course, Israel is uh, up in arms, of course, even that the negotiations are continuing, though I'm not quite sure what the alternative to that would be. So, it, I mean, I think it's important. Uh, as for arms control, this is something interesting in the US response to the uh, Russian, um, you know, proposed European security treaty. Uh, it, it, you know, this United States did say they're going to return to it. And of course, Biden renewed New Start when the very first act on assuming the president's uh, at the beginning of last year. So, uh, uh, and of course, arms control is the absolute epit epitome of, you know, what was the framework for diplomatic relations in the first Cold War. And so if we can, you know, I am thinking uh, if we're lucky, we can get to managing the second Cold War as effectively as we did the first after the Cuban Missile Crisis and the shock that gave us. So today, this Ukrainian shock could well be, you know, that turning point. But I just want to say with Nina that the quality of leadership, you know, we're talking about then Jack Kennedy, Bob Kennedy, and I see one of the questions in the chat, the back channel negotiations, um, which is extremely important uh, in the earlier uh, context. And well, I, you know, we don't know it, but I know that, I mean, we don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm sure there's plenty of plenty of discussions. I mean, even, for example, uh, Dimitri Symes, who is the, you know, head of the Center for National Interest, you know, very close contacts, he gets a lot of flack in the US, but somebody who is absolutely, you know, principled of the highest order with many contacts. I'm sure of him and others, are, you know, there's a constant, and of course, this isn't the Cold War, we've got endless channels of communication uh, going on and uh, you know the the kremlin itself is 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 extremely informed and has time and time again dampened down its own hotheads you have your menendez and you you pronounce it skiff do you uh, so uh, you have those guys but russia also in the duma has its own hotheads and constantly peskov putin in particular but uh, kazakh and others you know, are damping down this sort of talk and saying, you know, let's engage. So arms control is back on the agenda and that is to be welcomed. I yeah. want to apologize. Unfortunately, I do have to go. I want to thank you very, very much. And I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that um, I can't continue and, and, and finish this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Nina, for joining us and for your contributions. Maybe we'll go for, for till, uh, uh, to the half hour, we've got like three thank more you. questions to go. But thank you very much, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Great, great to meet you, all of you. Thanks. So, so Richard, one of the questions from Jeff Klein, who's a kind of a leading peace activist and organizer here in, in Massachusetts, is how do we understand the one hundred thousand or one hundred thirty thousand uh, Russian troops uh, around around Ukraine? Is it uh, is it simply there to bang door the bang, bang open the door for negotiations, or is there some other way to understand that? I begin to suspect that uh, Putin is like a big cat playing, toying with a big mouse, if you like, toying with Western war frenzy, because uh, uh, you know, as Nina said, there was the war um, fear scare way back in the spring, in April uh, of 2021. That was very much uh, specifically in response to the talk that they were going to try to, the Ukrainians would try to seize the Donbass by force and including the Crimea. Um, so today, uh, then, you know, this talk continued into this autumn. And uh, so, you know, the numbers, I don't know, but it's absolutely clear that there 
you know, the closest, by the way, to the border is 125 kilometers. So they're not, I mean, I'm talking about the Western forces, not Belarus, not the Crimea. Uh, and, you know, it's 125 kilometers. And the way they're deployed is that they've brought the equipment from Siberia and the Russian Far East. But a lot of the forces aren't actually there. And they're deployed as what is called camp formation in neat little rows and lines. And they're suddenly not in the, yes, OK, the first guards tank army. Is, is there. Uh, but, you know, the, I, I do, I stick to it, that this is a rather, like like Khrushchev put those missiles in Cuba to, st well, to, to scare the United States into perhaps negotiation. Uh, and so this is an equivalent, you know, this is a way of trying to start negotiation, just as the Cuban doing that was ill-advised. And of course, it rebounded against Khrushchev two years later. One of the reasons for his ouster was that rashness. Today, it's perhaps a really crazy sort of way of trying to get to the negotiating table. But ultimately, I think that's the bottom line. And the more the war frenzy builds up, the more arms they sent into Ukraine, the more likely then that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that wasn't, you know, I, I mean, there's no appetite. And as one of the questions in the chat would be, you know, what would you do? And, and Nina said it, 40 million Ukrainians who, many of them, uh, you know, they won't be welcoming the Russian forces as liberators with flowers and bread and salt. That's for sure. So two more questions, if we can uh, uh, exploit you to that degree. A couple of the questions here have to do with economic interests uh, on, on both sides. Uh, could you share some light about how economic interests and ambitions are playing out amidst this amidst this crisis? Uh, I'm yeah, I'm not quite sure uh, in what uh, what sense. I you know they, there's the Nord Stream two issue, which is the ratification of the second pipeline under the Baltic from the Ustluga to uh, Germany. Um, but that's peanuts. I mean, it's important for Russia. They spent about $10 billion on it. With this enormous spike in energy prices at the moment, Russia is um, absolutely overflowing with uh, revenues. This is the revenues of just a few days of energy sales. Obviously, Russia would like it to be open because it's had a strategy back in the 1990s under Yeltsin to bypass the bottlenecks Ukraine, the Baltic Republics and anywhere else where you have to have transit. And so the idea is constantly being to try to uh, access markets. As a result of all of this uh, bounty, Russia today has, a, uh, has foreign currency reserves of $620 billion, nearly $200 billion in its national, national welfare fund. In other words, Russia has built up a war chest in case they, you know, sanctions and other activities. It's built up a financial Chinese wall. Uh, now it's holding only about 15% of these reserves in dollars and the trade between Russia and China, you know, hitting over 140 billion now is more and more taking place in the yuan rubles and euro. So, you know, in, you know, in the economics and as we learned before 2014, globalization does not stop conflicts. It makes them more costly, more damaging. And of course, uh, part, part of this second Cold War is, of course, deglobalization, where now the world is splitting, including technological ones. The ban on Huawei was, you know, a sh for me, quite a shock because it was quite a clear sense that all that, you know, you know the idea of a genuine interdependent world really didn't take substance. So, but in, in these issues, the Ukraine and all of the, the security aspect, economics is secondary. It's, this is all about status, about geopolitics, and about security. So then the last sort of two-part interrelated question. Um, both Putin and, and Biden, Blinken as well, have stuck their necks out pretty far. Uh, and to de-escalate, there's going to have to be some face-saving uh, process. Uh, so basically, how do you see face saving playing out? And what do you think should be the priorities in terms of um, what do you think should be the priorities for U.S. international peace movements at this point? What should we what should we be demanding? What should we be doing? 
As for face saving, uh, I'll deal with uh, Putin Russia first. That uh, uh, if after, you know, there's a lot of talk that because he's now got all these forces, whatever the number is, that he just can't sort of pack up and go away. But he can. All he has to say is, you know, these were exercises. They didn't. They weren't up to full first. They were never in battle formation. Uh, the ones in Belarus, which, of course, Belarus is, by the way, an interesting story in and of itself. Um, that was just a military exercise. Crimea was just an insurance policy. And clearly, the fact that the Ukrainians did not attack and the United States and others uh, got to negotiating table so they could melt away. My feeling is, is that... Um, uh, you're absolutely right. If, you, if we're going to have this Cuban analogy in Q, in October 62, both sides had face saving formulae. Uh, and um, so but on the Russian side, that's not such an issue because no one really wanted war in the first place. So they just go back home and everything's fine. But it won't happen soon. I think Russia could keep these forces there uh, for many, many more months. And uh, by then, that war fever in the West, they would hope, will have uh, died down a bit. As for Biden, I, I think that he doesn't really have to have to save so much face because he did. He's been negotiating. He's been talking and he's been sending Blinken. Blinken, of course, has gone. And as uh, Nina said, just in they've just abused each other. And just like Blinken does with uh, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, and both Russians um, with uh, Sergei Ryabkov, the deputy foreign minister, and Maria Zaharova, the foreign ministry spokeslady, uh, spokesperson. Uh, she, um, you know, they, they've, they, they've all dropped the finesse of diplomacy because they're basically saying the only language to speak to the US leadership is this sort of brutal, harsh terms. Very unusual for the Chinese to do it. That meeting in Vancouver earlier this year, last year, was absolutely astonishing for the boldness of the language. And Putin and uh, the Russians are using that sort of language today. So as for, you know, and as, so but, but Biden is fine. As for Blinken and Sullivan, they learn, and Newland and that gang, they will never learn. So it's, um, that's good. As for the peace movement, and, you know, that's a fantastic question. And I often think about that because I've been, you know, I've been doing another session with, uh, in the UK, the Stop the War Coalition and uh, CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Uh, we'll be doing sessions in, in due course. Um and, and what should the peace movement do? It's funny because at the end of the first Cold War, the peace movement really did make a difference. You know, we're talking about the uh, deployment of crews and Pershing missiles to 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 England, but to to Europe more widely. Um, and what peace movements do is practice and you know to do what you know to be the future you want, as it were, which is. You know, to just to say, to point out that ultimately, uh, and, and the worst thing about the Second Cold War is that, that ultimately, it's there isn't that much. You know, Russians are. You know, I've, I was in Moscow in December, uh, and uh, you know, we one of the first session was an arms control conference, and speaker after speaker, these were you know were speak were speaking, and we had Americans there and Germans and others. And it's quite clear that we have to show uh, and then has to be the popular pressure for peace. And that that and the, the big weapon is knowledge. And so a session like today, I hope, will help in that respect. But it is knowledge. And to say that there isn't and maybe even learn from the peace movements of the 1980s, which is people to people contact contacts, pu public diplomacy, public meetings. As you say, I see that there's letters and others to your representatives and senators and so on. Uh, so um, that's all we can do. But, con you know, to, to constantly, um, you know, to maintain popular pressure, because elites in the UK and in the United States seem to me to be ever further distant from from the concerns of, of the people and in the United States, of course with the massive need for infrastructure, social, developmental uh, agenda, to spend nearly $800 billion this year on defense is, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's clearly, uh, we, we, the United States never managed to really cash in on that peace dividend after the first Cold War. 
let us set up an agenda of how that money can be spent for public goods at the end, if we can get there to the end of the second Cold War. Professor Sakwa, thank you so much. Uh, you know, your, your talk here and your writings have just been incredibly helpful. Uh, and I look forward, and I'm sure many people here on the call look forward to uh, uh, hearing you again, maybe to working with you and uh, amidst it all, stay well and uh, keep on keeping on. Thank you very much. And I wish you all success. <laughs>